crisis is only getting more and more urgent. Yet the world leaders, the British politicians and our local representatives keep holding up the system of capitalism, the destructive, barbaric capitalist system that is driving this climate catastrophe. They care more about lining their own pockets than about the preservation of our planet. We at Earthstrike Merseyside see that it is imperialism, the most vicious and advanced stage of capitalism, the stage in which we are living right now, where you have entire countries growing off the backs of exploiting other countries. It's that imperialism which is fueling mass ecological destruction, untold of environmental destruction and immeasurable human suffering. Welcome to Revolutionary Lumpen Radio, the podcast for the Lumpen from the left and from the left to the Lumpen. In this episode, I'm just going to go over an event that I attended with Airstrike Merseyside where we actually occupied an HSBC. It was thrilling, it was revolutionary, and you're going to hear it all here. I'm going to let the speeches, the chants, the marching, do the talking. Sorry about the audio quality and whatnot, but... I mean, I only had my phone on me, and I was really just looking forward to doing some journalism that day, so this is the result of that. So this is an Earthstrike Merseyside hosted event. Bank picket for the planet on Friday 31st of January at 12pm. Join the fight back. So first we assembled at the Bond Out Church. Earthstrike Merseyside called this strike because the climate crisis is only getting more and more urgent. So we plan to march down Bold Street and then Church Street before we get to the bank. When we get there, we have five introductions prepared with some more specific examples about the crimes that this bank is committing. When our planet is under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back! When our planet is under attack, what do we do? Stand up, fight back! Yeah, so at this point, the march had begun. We had lots of pickets, lots of pretty cool signs. Um, Comrades really got creative and it really paid off. There was plenty of pickets to go around and then we began to march as well as chant down Bold Street, just parallel to the bombed out church, which is literally <laughs> like a bombed out church from World War II. We were marching down Bold Street. The reactions we got were pretty supportive. We had people on the phones, we had loads of people, thumbs up. Even when we were at the bombed out church, waiting around, till everybody had gathered together, people were going past, honking the horns, giving thumbs up. It's really interesting to see the, the response of the people who aren't involved in this whatsoever, but it is completely spontaneous in their eyes. So that's something I, I love to see every time. During the march, it's probably about quarter of a mile maybe less towards hsbc it goes on to church street and church street's like pretty much the main high street in the city center it's got probably a majority of shops on within you know a short space and probably gathers the most foot traffic as well the most people who actually walk through town probably are likely to go to church street so it's good to be doing this kind of marching with chance literally in the most busiest places in the city and some of the chants are actually pretty funny i thought uh, i'd never heard most of them before <laughs> um, we had comrades on the microphone on the megaphone gi- giving it all rallying us unfortunately i didn't know many chants so <laughs> it, it was a, it was an opportunity for me to learn and um, learn some chants hopefully for the future Climate change is a war of the rich against the poor. 
Climate change is a war of the rich against the poor. Climate change is a war of the rich against the poor. Climate change is a threat. Eliminate the third world debt. Climate change is a threat. Eliminate the third world debt. Climate change is a threat. Eliminate the third world debt. Climate change is a threat. Eliminate the third world debt. System change, not climate change. 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 Before we get into the bank situation, like literally into the bank. I just want to really comment on how well Airstrike Merseyside I've done to organise this. They've done the flyers, they've done the leaflets, they've done the posters, they've done the designs for all of those. The comrades who got out there, you know, gluing them all around the city to draw people in. It's, it's really outstanding praxis. <laughs> I mean, it's literally what what you do with. So I, I just completely commend them and take my hat off to them. Absolutely phenomenal work, comrades. Revolution! Consolation! Revolution! Consolation! Revolution! Climate change is a threat! Eliminate the third world death! Climate change is a threat! Eliminate the third world death! Exchange won't take us from climate change! Bullshit! Cut off it! The enemy is profit! The one on the stock exchange won't take us from climate change! Bullshit! Cut off it! The enemy is profit! So... As the march, march through Church Street, hopefully gathered a few supporters. If they did, they were in for a surprise, because I certainly was. <laughs> um, it's got to be noted that, we, say, we were heading towards the HSBC in the main part of the city centre, and like I, I totally did not know that we were going inside the bank. <laughs> I swear, I, I didn't know. So, like, we were heading towards the bank. I thought we were going to do the right when we were coming up to it, towards the Met Court and, like, set up shop, sh- like, shop there or something and give speeches there. But no. So, as you might have heard earlier, comrade said that there was going to be five speakers. Uh, there, there was, so I just didn't know that the speaking was inside the bank. So there was a banner at the front of the march held by about four comrades. There was about 40 odd or so behind and there was really a momentum with, you know, the chanting. And, you know, there was definitely a momentum in our movement because we were heading forwards, we were heading towards the door for the bank now. And once... (laughs) Once we were in there, the chances kind of stopped and then everybody seemed to get organised and gather around the building, all around the outside of the building, uh, towards the windows. Basically, had half of the bottom floor, like, windows covered if you were looking in, because obviously all these buildings nowadays are, like, glass, because that's just hyper-trendy, isn't it? It just makes you want to spend all your money in that building because it looks so modern and whatnot, so... Yeah, so we were in there, and then that's when the uh, microphone come out, and the comrades got to start the speeches as was planned. And this is where the substance comes into the march, and the whole point of what these comrades say in the speeches is really so relevant, and is really the reason why HSBC is the target. Could have, of course, picked many targets. It's not just HSBC. That's the only bad band. Let me just say that, you know, with any bourgeois institution to me, I mean, pfft, is scum so let me just say that for revolutionary lump and radio one bourgeois institution one ruling class imperialist member of the state more than another they're all equally evil so <laughs> with that being said let me let's just listen to what these comrades protesting about Industry 
Shame on you. Let's take Merseyside Cider here at HSBC to tell you how banks are directly destroying our planet and driving climate change through the capitalist economic system. A system which not only relies but thrives on exploitation for profit. The imperialist banks foster and feed from the, off the financial helplessness of others, especially the oppressed nations of the world. The super profits of capitalist imperialism have been increasingly supplemented over the last decade by massive profits arising from international bank lending to the oppressed nations. This is set enslavement and equates to modern day colonialism. The third world debt I've been to be forces outside. the developed nations I've been to be into imperialist bondage, uh, while territory uh, giant extractive uh, monopolies uh, within the city of London, yeah, the me. British banks are placed in the lead. Too many countries labour under the servicing of these unsustainable debts. Rich. Many developing countries and billions of people are devastated under the burden of debt and trade policies of the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and the World Trade Organization. In 1997, Zambia spent 40% of its total budget to repay foreign debt and only 7% for basic human services, like vaccines for children. If the debt had been cancelled in 1997, for 20 of the poorest countries. The money released for basic health care could have saved the lives of about 21 million children. If the debt for 20 of the poorest countries and the money could have released the basic health care, it could have saved the lives of 21 million children by the year 2000, the equivalent of 19,000 children a day. The failure to cancel debts leaves the poorest countries in the world with nothing to spend on basic needs and much needed infrastructure, leaving millions in poverty and destitution. In 1999, $128 million was transferred from the poorest countries to the richest for debt repayments each day. Of this, $53 million was from East Asia and the Pacific. $38 million from South Asia and $23 million from Africa. Backed by the US and British governments, the World Bank is exploiting third world indebtedness to extend its enabling business agriculture indicator to 80 developing countries, requiring them to establish land titles on all common land to enable its sale to agribusiness multinationals. Between 2001 and 2014, agribusiness land grabs in Africa for 56 million hectares. Already, more than 25% of the world's crops are grown in regions with severe water shortages. These are funded by British banks. These are funded by HSBC. 33 global banks invested and combined $1.9 trillion in fossil fuel companies between 2015 and 2018. HSBC was the 13th largest oh, investor, while Barclays continues to launch car sound yeah, exploitation yeah. in Canada. This makes the prospect of the 2016 Paris Agreement impossible. Action against eco destruction has to start with the fact that the British mining and oil monopolies loot and plunder the resources of underdeveloped countries, while the City of London and its linked offshore centres hold these countries in a web of unrepayable debt. Yeah, so a comrade's absolutely on point there. By the way, I'm just saying on comrade, 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 this and that all the time because obviously, like, I'm not just going to say everybody's names and that. Uh, it's worth mentioning that at this point, I think that there'd been like one, two, or three pigs that had shown up 
because <laughs> obviously we were we were in a bank and I don't actually know of anything that's actually happening in my city quite like this a uh, protest within a bank <laughs> people shouting solidarity people shouting well well people have, having speeches within the bank denouncing them denouncing capitalism imperialism and also, and also articulating that to a crowd which had grown from the outside who were looking inside thinking what the heck is is going on inside that bank there's banners there's pickets there's revolutionaries in there i've got to check this out uh so of course they did <laughs> and, and, and they were right too because i'm sure it wasn't just interest i'm sure that the people who joined us and got on the phones and started cheering the protest on social media and presuming or to at least the relatives were are people who were certainly involved and, and completely sympathetic to the fact that they're going to be eliminated as a species by capitalism. Yeah, there was about there was about two three pigs there at this point. I think like there was there, like a few people were were nervous. I definitely saw a few people are uh, flapping themselves. But I also I was planning on like I was just thinking like if a busy tries to grab me, I'm obviously gone. So I was thinking I'm just gonna bail like down this church street. I was thinking how am I getting away from all these cameras and that? It was like. I'm just going to fully like book a taxi and then just jump a job somewhere else and then just jump out and then book another job and that. And so like they can't find me. <laughs> so I mean, I was saying other people were flapping, but I guess I was just hiding it better than them. They was definitely uh, heightened theirs, but this is nothing compared to class war. It's just a prerequisite. So if you haven't got the bottle for, for, for this, you know, occupying a bank, he said, you haven't got the bottle for class war, and all of us definitely have <laughs> my comrades. So, with everybody keeping an eye on the police, back to the event. Banks shall continue to disregard the impending climate disaster so long as their profits grow from the exploitation of the so called third world nations. They will continue to build the unit and plundering of these nations, these, these nations' resources through mining and iron business and multinational corporations. Banks such as HSBC benefit from the surplus value of their investment between 2015 and 2018. HSBC invested 57 million dollars in the fossil fuel industry. It's not my phone, it's Steve. I think he said you just like. I do have a printout version. Is it just you don't want to do that? No, no, I want to do it. I just need it to be filmed to go on the internet to show the lads. Well, I'm not sure if you're going to do it. Yeah. So you're going to go right at the end, so you don't need to do it yet. That's fine, that's fine, but can you just record it though? I'll just do it on my phone and then I'll send it to you after. Boston. HSBC invests in companies that are not only the best in the world, we demand that HSBC and other banks fully respect all human rights, particularly the rights of indigenous peoples, the rights to their land and the rights to their water. We must call out the banks, and we must call out HSBC for the role they play in the destruction of the planet. Climate change is the war of the rich against the poor, and we are on the side of the poor. But we stand with the poor against the exploitation propped up by these fights. Shame on you, HSBC. Shame, Shame on, on you, HSBC. Next week, we're going to hear about the devastating impacts of HSBC's investment in deforestation and palm oil production. HSBC, shame on you. Shame on you.
of foreign swap trading. We need unprecedented damages on the human system and particularly indigenous people. Banks are complicit in this devastation. And HSBC has funded 13.2 billion pounds in loans and 1.7 billion pounds in corporate bonds and hardware houses. Overall, in 2012, the Southeast Asia oil industry received $55 billion in investment. Although HSBC is a member of the round table of capitalist imperialism and the banks that operate within it are destroying our planet, HSBC invests in companies such as Shell, BC, and PetroChina all of which have been exposed as high-risk corporations due to both human rights violations and the roles they play in climate destruction. We are here today at HSBC to draw attention to the absolutely unjustifiable damage that banks such as this one cause to the planet. HSBC in particular, through its continued investment in the occupation of Palestinian territory by the State of Israel, allows for the relentless exploitation of land and resources, as well as merciless cruelty towards the Palestinian people. We need to start building the movement now. We need to show people that we are committed to fighting climate change and that we will be heard. The is arming Israel, including 180 million in BAE systems. Manufacturers of components for fighter jets and 180 million in Boeing who provide Apache helicopters to Israel. The UK is complicit in Israel's violations of Palestinian human rights for investment in supporting the global arms trade. These actions not only result in the direct murder of civilians but also in the destabilizing of the environments which condemns countless other individuals to living in a massively precarious state. Israeli settlers in the West Bank consume approximately six times the amount of water used by Palestinian population living in the same territory, with 480,000 settlers consuming as much water as 2.3 million Palestinians. The situation in Gaza is compounded by Israel's siege, which, among other things, has led to overpopulation and exploitation of groundwater resources, resulting in the increasing depletion of the coastal aquifer all of which has rendered 90% of the water supply unfit for human consumption. Many communities are relying more and more on heavily on rainwater for agriculture, and greater and more extreme fluctuations in rainfall and temperature change make their lifestyle increasingly vulnerable. In contrast to this, the settlers have access to reliable, year-round water supply and agricultural support. The Israeli army also regularly spreads herbicides on Palestinian Arab land close to the fence, separating them from now, uh, Israel. According to the Red Cross, these activities not only damage Palestinian crops, but also contaminate the soil and further damage Arab and Palestinian land in the area. Almost every year, there are regular attacks by the settlers on Palestinian farmers, resulting in the burning, uprooting, and chopping down of precious olive trees, as well as vicious attacks directed at farmers. Olives are one of the biggest sources of income for Palestine, supporting 100,000 families and providing a quarter of the country's earnings. This absolute disregard for the people and land of Palestine demonstrates the racist contempt that is held towards and by the Israeli state. It's also been estimated that some 80% of the rubbish generated by Israeli settlements is being dumped in the West Bank. Various Israeli industries in the army are also known to discard toxic waste on Palestinian land. Further, a report published by the Palestine Israel Journal explains that a number of polluting factors were moved from Israel to the West Bank due to carcinogenic chemical emissions and protests from the Israeli public. A pesticide factory which produces dangerous pollutants has been moved to an area in Palestine in the West Bank. The Dixon Gas Industrial Factory, which was located inside Israel, has also been moved to the area. The solid waste generated by the factory is burned in the open air. Even within the state of Israel, attempts to move toward net zero carbon emissions have failed miserably. In early 2018, the Israeli Ministry of Energy produced a plan to shift from polluting fuels like coals and natural gases. The plan aims to achieve a target of as little as 
of production from the renewable energy by 2030, with an interim target of 10% by the year 2020. This target is absolutely laughable. Israel is clearly a state that should be opposed, not only for its blatant racist and merciless policy towards the Palestinian people, but also for its lack of care for the planet and the long-term damage of their action. This occupation can only function as a direct result of funding that comes from right here in the UK. The nature of banks requires constant growth that cares little for human life and environmental protections. When we say silent about the crimes that HSBC and all banks commit in our name, we are condoning this kind of action. The issue once again highlights that climate change is not a natural occurrence. It is a result of political systems which not only enable but reward this type of blatant disregard for human life and the welfare of the planet. So it's more important than ever that we take a stand against these horrendous acts and resist the institutions that allow them to continue. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. Palestine. Palestine. We are demanding honesty and transparency in carbon reductions. 
We are demanding real actions and a real system change. The conference has also completely failed to introduce any regulation on private trade and credit. But at the moment, it is proposed that any credit sold on the, on the global market, 2% will be cancelled out by way of fighting the um, carbon tax private trade. But yet, there are no regulations introduced on private trade. This means that they can avoid, countries can avoid taking 2%. And it also means that they can avoid the commitment to give 2% of credit towards development in underdeveloped nations. So far, draft text only strongly recommends the voluntary cancellation of credit. The commitment of rich nations to provide finance to poorer nations so that they can develop alongside a global reduction in emissions was outlined all the way back in 1997 at the start of the Kyoto Protocol. The agreement defined the responsibility. The agreement defined the responsibility of rich nations in fighting climate change by way of the historic environmental implications of imperialism. But the EU has opposed this at the current COP25 talks, arguing that raising future ambitions under the Paris Agreement should apply to all countries equally. Again, we are seeing the burden of climate change being put on foreign nations. The UK is far from innocent in this. While the UK might claim that they produced overall emissions by 42% since 1990, they're failing to account for territorial emissions. The UK is the biggest net importer of carbon dioxide emissions per capita in the G7 group. There was an increase from 1.7 tonnes in 1992 to 5.1 tonnes in 2007. Through their funding of exploitative fossil fuel and palm oil industries, HSBC is only standing to profit from this outsourcing of emissions. While HSBC might have pledged to end fossil fuel investment, they refused to agree to any investment in Indonesia, Bangladesh and Vietnam. They're claiming this is to help development in these countries, but we cannot be ruled by that. HSBC doesn't care about people, it cares about profits. As my comrade said, HSBC ranks 13 out of the 33 banks who've invested 1.9 trillion in fossil fuel since 2015. HSBC is also investing in companies that are at the forefront of the forest burning in Indonesia. These investments only continue to exploit working class people in underdeveloped countries while destroying their local environments. The UK government is only serving the interests of these people when they try to focus their progress on domestic emissions. They are intentionally ignoring the fact that the majority of production and therefore emissions are outsourced. And again, they are trying to put the burden on poorer countries to take responsibility for climate change. The COP25 negotiations have only gone to show that there is no viable solution under capitalism. The next conference being held in Glasgow is our opportunity to demand action and a real, real solution to climate change. The compromises made in COP25 that I discussed in this speech are not yet agreed. And the COP26 conference is our chance to stop these concessions. But we need to start building the movement now. We need to show people that we are committed to fighting climate change and that we will be heard. Woo! <laughs> Hearing about all the death and destruction that are part of the capitalist system, the system in which HSBC operates and profits from should not only make us angry, it should make us resolved to fight back, fight for a future that is fit for humanity, a future without war, without poverty, without environmental destruction and without racism. Cuba stands as an example to show that that world is possible. Cuba is the world leader in sustainable development. To live within the carrying capacity of the Earth's ecosystem, we have to have an ecological footprint. Okay, so it's worth noting that at this point, there were two pig horses with two pigs on them. 
and there was two busy cars. They had about four busies in each car, and then the like. Obviously, the the horses were walking up and down Church Street and that, and uh, all, all the busies <laughs> were in the bank. Like, uh, the, I mean, I think at this point they told us to leave basically, and they told us, you know, we were we were trespassing, and. They even tried to like um you know one of one of the the male pigs reached out and then tried to touch a comrade who was speaking um as if to like to get her to stop and then she just moved out the way obviously because I don't know what <laughs> I literally have no idea what kind of rights we had to be in there, but there was um uh, what do you call it like a correspondent to flipping somebody that who the busies talk to. So nobody else has to speak to, uh, actually. And um, if, if he listens, you know, thank you so much. You've done just such a terrific job. Uh, just sheer comrade experience that we all need to learn when dealing with, with the pigs in order to demonstrate. But, yeah, so so they brought out the horses as if we were going to cause a big massive riot and they just needed to like charge through us. Um, as if they were knights defending the monarchy in some kind of feudalistic realm. I thought that we were living in 2020, but of course everybody's still living in feudalistic times. So there was them busy horses and then there was them busies uh, just basically trying to kick us out at this point. While at the same time absolutely pooping all downtown this is the reason why people stopped using horses it's because of the waste so i don't suppose any of those police like cleaned up after themselves goddamn pigs so when it comes to my speech at this point we're basically like told to get out or they're going to start arresting people for aggravated trespassing because of course the police of the state they defend bankers and ruling class and the last thing they want is justice for us politicians, the masses. So I just kind of had to give my speech on the way out. <laughs> it probably never helped me reading because at one point I did kind of stutter over what I was reading and lose where I was. So, I mean, we just simply went outside rather than stayed inside where the pigs were getting made to feel vulnerable because they had no control over the situation and we didn't move out of the way when comrade was pushed where a lady police pig said yeah you need to get out or like i'll i'll make you get out so i mean while while they started all their threats and their stupid petty pig mind games we we just simply moved out what as i was giving me speech mankind we have now become aware of this problem but it's almost too late to stop it it is necessary to point out that consumer capitalist societies are fundamentally responsible for the brutal destruction of the environment. But they arise from the old colonial powers and from imperialist policies which have in turn endangered the backwardsness of poverty which today afflicts the vast majority of mankind. With only 20% of the world's population, these societies consume two-thirds of the world's metals and three-fourths of the energy produced in the world. Yeah. They have poisoned the seas and the rivers. They have polluted our air, weakened and punctured even the ozone layer. They have saturated the atmosphere with gases which are beginning, which are changing weather conditions with a catastrophic effect that we're already beginning to experience and see in our news. The forests are disappearing the deserts are expanding. Every year thousands of millions of the fertile soil ends in the sea. Numerous species are becoming extinct. Population pressures and poverty take a frenzy out of the way of the doorway just so the doorway's fully clear. To the frenzy efforts to survive even when people could get in as long as we even when it's at the expense of the environment. It is not possible to blame the third world countries for this. 
Yesterday, they were colonies. Today, they are nations exploited and pillaged by an unjust international economic order. You know it as imperialism. The solution cannot be to prevent the development of those who need it most. The reality is that everything that nowadays contributes to the underdevelopment and poverty constitutes a flagrant violation of ecology. But the tens of millions of men, women and children starve every single year in the third world as a result of this. More than each of the two world wars. Unequal terms of trade, protectionism and a foreign debt assault assault the ecology and promote the destruction of the environment. If we want to save mankind from this self-destruction, we have to better redistribute the wealth and the technologies available to the world, to us humans. Less luxury and less waste by a few countries is needed so that there can be less poverty and less hunger on a large part of the earth. We do not need any more transference to the third world of lifestyles and consumption habits that ruin the environment. Let human life become more rational. Let us implement a just international economic order. Let us use all the science necessary for pollution-free, sustained development that is therefore their forces against the means of profit from the rich, the bourgeoisie, the ruling class who oppress us. Let us pay the ecological debt and not the foreign debt. Let hunger disappear and not mankind. Now that the alleged threat of communism has disappeared and there are no longer any more excuses for cold wars, arms races, military spending, what is blocking the immediate use of these resources to promote the development of the third world and fight for the threat, and fight the threat of ecological destruction on the planet? Let selfishness end, let hegemonies end, let insensitivity, insensitivity, irresponsibility and deceit end. Tomorrow will be too late to do what we should have done a long time ago. That was 1992. We need to do more since then. We need to smash capitalism, smash imperialism, smash the state. Mankind. We have now become aware of this problem, but it's almost too late to stop it. It is necessary to point out that consumer capitalist societies are fundamentally responsible for the brutal destruction of the environment. But they arise from the old colonial powers and from imperialist policies which have in turn endangered the backwardsness of poverty which today afflicts the vast majority of mankind. With only 20% of the world's population, these societies consume two-thirds of the world's metals and three-fourths of the energy produced in the world. Yeah. They have poisoned the seas and the rivers. They have polluted our air, weakened and punctured even the ozone layer. They have saturated the atmosphere with gases, which are beginning which are changing weather conditions with a catastrophic effect that we're already beginning to experience and see it on news. The forests are disappearing, the deserts are expanding. Every year thousands of millions of the fertile soil ends in the sea. Numerous species have become extinct. Out of the way of the Population pressure, pressures and poverty. Like, you just ask them to take a frenzy out of the way of the doorway, just so the doorway's fully clear. Sugar, sugar yeah, yeah, yeah. frenzy, yeah, yeah. efforts to survive, even bit. when people could get in as long as we, there's a few yeah. meters there, people could get in and out. Even when it's at the expense of the environment. It is not possible to blame the third world countries for this. Yesterday, they were colonies. Today, they are nations exploited and pillaged by an unjust international economic order. You know it as imperialism. The solution cannot be to prevent the development of those who need it most. The reality is that everything that nowadays contributes to the underdevelopment and poverty constitutes a flagrant violation violation of ecology. But the tens of millions of men, women and children starve every single year 
in the third world as a result of this. More than each of the two world wars. On equal terms of trade, protectionism and a foreign death assault. The assault the ecology and promote the destruction of the environment. If we want to save mankind from this self-destruction, we have to better redistribute the wealth and the technologies available to the world, to us humans. Less luxury and less waste by a few countries is needed so that there can be less poverty and less hunger on a large part of the earth. We do not need any more transparent to the third world of, of lifestyles and consumption habits that ruin the environment. Let human life become more rational. Let us implement a just international economic order. Let us use all the science necessary for pollution-free, sustained development that is therefore enforces against the means of profit from the rich, the bourgeoisie, the ruling class who oppresses. Let us pay the ecological debt and then foreign debt and not the foreign debt. Let hunger disappear and not mankind. Now that the alleged threat of communism has disappeared and there are no longer any more excuses for cold wars, arms races, military spending, what is blocking the immediate use of these resources to promote the development of the third world and fight for the threat, and fight the threat of ecological destruction on the planet? Let selfishness end, let hegemonies end, let insensitivity, insensitivity, irresponsibility and deceit end. Tomorrow will be too late to do what we should have done a long time ago. That was 1992. We need to do more since then. We need to smash capitalism, smash imperialism, smash the state. So yeah, that was the end of the speeches. I hope you found them interesting. I hope it's shown or shed light on why we were at HSBC that day and why the banks are forces of evil. The banks are, of course, components to imperialism. They work. I mean, I mean, obviously, the bankers go hand in hand with the state, the bourgeoisie. It comes down to investing in weapons, war, oil, or the resources that provide the most return if you were to invest in them and of course the most return comes from the most damaging harmful not just not just resources in terms of like energy but also you literally get the most profit out of like in, in investing in in arms manufacturing and war it's really a fucked up world we live in and this is one struggle that i was really happy to lend my voice and my presence in and it's absolutely something you should always do yourself always try and find who's local nearby even if they don't share the same political beliefs climate activism is something that we can absolutely all stand together on uh, so i mean i just want to mention now i'll do a little sign off before the sign off but thank you again to airstrike thank you so much for the opportunity to give that speech i really enjoyed it um, you know it was just a, a good day overall but it's not like we as activists or i mean at least i think any serious revolutionary like does any of this for shits and gigs it's not enjoyable in the sense that yeah, the earth's dying. It means I get to do all of these protests. No, it would be great if we never had to. It would be great if I didn't have to be a revolutionary. It would be great if we could all just go about our lives. But the comrades who went out and again raised the, su- raised the support, got the numbers on board of people to go out, they really had to take time out of their day to do that. So, I mean, it's really inspiring from where I'm standing and I hope it's that inspiration reaches out to you comrades and again just just try and organise locally with people and just try and you know lend your presence because as I mentioned earlier you'd be surprised to see what kind of reaction you get from the public you get you get all kinds of people cheering you and of course other people are busy with their own families their own ideologies but uh, the uh, I think Un- underlyingly people need us to do these kind of protests and, and activism and whatnot so i really can't wait to see in a year two years 
know, what's come of, of Earth Strike Mercy Sarah, because I've got a lot of hope and optimism within them. They've definitely got my support. Uh, must be not worth. I mean, I could leave this out for sake of being called a sectarian, but Airstrike International are liberals. It's like Airstrike, the main people who, unlike that international board, the, the Discord, the Reddit, they're liberals. <laughs> um, I'd be genuinely shocked if I saw any activism come out of them. So, yeah, I probably just ruined all the positive things that I've just said. <laughs> But it's really worth noting to me because um, I am a Marxist-Leninist, maybe a bit of Maoist in me, I'm a revolutionary, and I know these people, and I know that they said that the Earthstrike movement is dead, and I've seen it very much alive. I really just want to say everybody's names, but I'm, I'm really just so proud that a movement like Airstrike with, with its potential isn't dead and it's definitely strong in the United Kingdom. So we just went outside after we got kicked out and then we set up a stall. Stalls are where we just basically stand around, sell the fight raisins and fights and pails and newspaper as well as try and recruit people, get people to sign a petition, try and get people's contact details if they're interested in the city centre again in Church Street. Yeah, so so before that though, there was an open mic, so we passed the mic out and just let other, other comrades from other beliefs, other ideologies, other organisations have their say. And it's not something you see in my city, they don't have open mics. Precisely for the fact that they are sectarian. They don't want people like Airstrike to have a say because what they say is too revolutionary and they might lose members in their paid organisation if people listen to the message of revolution, socialism, instead of liberal pro-labour organisations who, yeah, exclude everybody who wants an open mic, exclude people from actually participating in, in anything more than the rallies, which are nothing more than photo shoots. So yeah, I just kind of went off track there and just gave my insight. I probably shouldn't have and I probably just kept, should have kept it like sweet and on subject, but there we have it. I've just got it off my chest now. So I'm just going to give the speeches from the open mic and then I'm going to sign off and then I'm going to leave just with the tune, which you should absolutely listen to. It's very re- relevant and it's very funny and it's very deep. And their role in the climate crisis. I found a quote that's from Mark Carney, who is the outgoing governor of the Bank of England. And he said that climate change is a tragedy on the horizon. But um, he's wrong because climate change is a tragedy that's already happening um, across the world and it is only going to get worse. And as it gets worse, it's going to affect the poorest and most vulnerable members of society first. And it's impossible to ignore the impact that billionaires and the millionaire class has on on our planet. Extortionate greed um, is equal to extortionate wealth, which has been detrimental to our world, our communities and our environment. Disparity between the wealthiest and poorest on this earth is like the most damning indictment of human greed that there is. But in Extinction Rebellion, we believe that there's a world that is better. Uh, One thing I've learned about the climate crisis is that it's impossible to cost. You can't put a price on the loss of ecosystems, on the loss of species, or really on the loss of human life. Uh, You can't translate this into economic terms. So because we live in a capitalist system, it's like they equal nothing. And unfortunately for us, it's very easy to um, quantify the cost of oil and investment in fossil fuels. Um, And these industries have built our Western nations into powerhouses, so we can't ignore the fact that it'll be really difficult to give up that power. And it will be hard and painful for us all. So I'm not going to stand here and tell you how that must be done. I'm just going to offer a different solution. Uh, In the middle of Liverpool, it kind of feels really far away from power because like Mark Harney isn't going to hear this speech, the heads of HSBC aren't going to hear this speech, Um, just everyday people from Liverpool are. And so in XR, um, we are rethinking our strategy because we need everybody to be on board with this. We need you and actually we are you, we're just normal everyday people that are just trying to fight this. 
the climate crisis really doesn't feel relevant to everybody's lives because it's impossible to worry about the future when you're worrying about the next five minutes. Uh, the system has us trapped and we're calling for it to change. Our everyday struggles are mirrored in the climate struggle. We have all the resources that we need, they're just unevenly distributed. And we have the infrastructure and the money needed to improve the lives of everybody. It's just that it's in the hands of the wrong people. And we, the people, have the power. We just need to use it. We're calling for system change. Instead of a system that relies on economic growth, that insists on funding oil companies and destroying our world, we're calling for a regenerative culture. And it must be equal and it must be radical. Radical in its care and its community. And um, there's no denying that as people that just live everyday lives, we're children of a capitalist system, but that system is stealing the world from our children and our children's children. Nature will do what nature does and the earth itself will continue without humanity. But um, what will happen along the way if we don't act now to mitigate the effects and fight for climate justice is that people, real, everyday people like you and I, will have their lives devastated by a man-made crisis of greed. So we want people to join us, uh, call out the banks, call out the companies that cause this. We're not the 1%. We've got to, across class, across cities, across countries, we have to come together. Um, you don't have to be any kind of particular person to be a part of it. You just need to care. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you to Earthstrike for organising. Uh, I've been campaigning on for five years as a councillor, but actually it's been about 20 years that I've been, been canvassed uh, on this. But I moved to Liverpool in 2000 to study environmental science. It's been quite tough being an environmentalist all that time, but actually now is one of the most encouraging times. There's a new generation of activists, people like Earthstrike, Youth Strike for Climate. The young people have pushed climate right up the agenda and it's really encouraging. So thank you all for that. Thanks for the work you're all doing. It, it, it's amazing. Today, the, 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 the occupation of HSB Bank was an excellent example of uh, non-violent direct action, awareness raising. Uh, it was a really important piece of work and you know, well done to everybody involved in putting it together. And I think it's really important to highlight the role of banks in the climate emergency. They are continuing to pump hundreds of billions of pounds into oil ex exploration, expansion of the oil industry and keeping those disastrous industries going. Since the Paris Climate Accord, which everybody hailed as a, a huge new chapter for the environmental movement, banks across the world have put 1.9 trillion into the oil industry. So they are currently pumping billions of pounds into this industry that we need to get rid of. So it's absolutely right to be doing actions like this today, to be demonstrating and to be you know, making our voice heard. But why are the banks carrying on with this kind of investment? We all feel like these should be a waste of money because that oil's got to stay in the ground, right? Why are they carrying on doing it? And it's because they, they don't listen to the rhetoric of governments. They look at their actions. They look at what they're actually doing. This government has just signed off the building of a massive new gas power station that Drax are going to build. That is going to become the single biggest uh, carbon dioxide emitter in our electricity supply. So that goes 100% completely counter to any rhetoric on the climate. As well as that, we're seeing a determination to expand aviation and billions being pumped into road expansion and increasing the capacity of our roads. All of this leads to one simple thing in the eyes of a banker. It shows that demand for oil is going to go up, so it's a good investment. And locally, the situation isn't much better. We've got a local council here in Liverpool planning to build new dual carriageways, planning to expand the cruise industry, aviation, everything you can think of that is just going to add to the city's global warming emissions. So at every level, governments are not acting on their rhetoric. That's why I am a Green Party politician, because the Green Party have been consistent from day one that we need to run our economy in a way that 
is in keeping with, with the Earth's natural ecosystem, it's absolutely essential that we have decision makers at every level, in councils, in the government, who honestly believe that our economy has to uh, be within the Earth's ecological limits. It's absolutely essential. We need to change the rules. At the moment, the game rewards investment in oil and doesn't reward investment in renewable energy, in cycling infrastructure, that kind of thing. So we need a government that will bring in a carbon tax, that will simply make oil become more expensive over time. That would soon stop investment in oil. We need to end road building, we need to end the growth of aviation, and we need to actually divert all that investment into a huge investment in renewables and energy efficiency. We need decision makers who will show investors that that is what is going to be done. That is the only way to change this. So essentially, it's got to be a very simple message to the bankers. The oil in the ground is going to stay in the ground. So if you put money into that, you're just burning your money. We need to have a government that will invest in renewables and any efficiency. And that's why, as well as occupying banks, as well as demonstrating, as well as shouting about this problem and raising awareness, everybody needs to get involved with politics as well and help elect a different kind of politician who can actually make proper, better decisions for the climate. Thank you. Thank you. Is it? Are we on? Yeah. Alright guys, um, I'd like to thank uh, comrades here today for talking about very uh, worthy uh, cases of colonialism that should be uh, highlighted in foreign countries. However, you do not have to look far to see the impacts of colonialism in the other nations that England has traveled with in an unfair union. Now, Scottish North Sea oil is being used not as it should be used to fund public services, education and health, and instead it is being used to fund blood wars in the Middle East, in the Israeli occupation of Palestine, and in uh, propping up the capitalist class. Uh, James Connolly, a uh, Scottish and Irish revolutionary, said that when we liberate ourselves from the imperialists, the only thing we can do is get rid of the bankers next, otherwise we'll simply be in their pocket. Thank you for letting me speak and thanks for letting me be a part of this case. <laughs>
Yo. First up was the thief with the worst reputation Dictator with the third world nation He looked the devil in the eyes he spoke In an oh so serious tone Dear Mr. Devil, I am the greatest thief that ever has been on earth Please tell me who else more than me Personifies your work I came to power in the military coup I murdered the elected president He wanted to use the resources of our country for our people's benefit I proved the masters in the west I could kill my own people as well as the best So I took over the so-called independent country When the foreigners left Sent squads to death for those who would suggest In power should be the ones they elect Erected a statue of the great man Erected our mothers, stole our lands That's how little self-respect I have Don't fight slavery, it makes me glad Account in Switzerland, Rolls Royce Murder or rape cause I want new toys Don't want a portion, a whole fortune With that profit was a little bit of torture Even outlawed my indigenous culture And language and history And taught our people to only worship colonizers And of course, me Wonderful man, you most ejaculated on his hands But the monarch of the empire said Excuse me Mr. Devil, I'd like to speak if I may Who do you think trained this amateur dictator to behave this way? Yeah, I'm sure before I came along His country was far from heaven But look at the carnage I've caused all over the earth It's got to be the work of the devil Countless deaths, mass enslavement Deliberate starvation of whole nations The dictator tries his best But looking at me, he's just an imitation Who do you think pays his wages? He would love to be trading places Cause I've been doing this thing on the road Way back, way back, way back since the middle of ages Everybody knows he's a criminal element They think I'm democratic and benevolent And that shows that I'm really devilish Cause people think I'm heaven sent I couldn't care about democracy You all know no one elected me The people love me despite my crimes Sucker MCs wanna bite my shine So bling and out of control you would vomit Don't even touch dope but my face is on it Pervert, using the cloak of the clergy, yes, I'm a pervert, using the cloak, I'm a despicable character, I use my position of authority and spiritual reverence, I'm a despicable character. Mr. Devil, allow me to speak All the religious leaders that leech In the world of creeps, I'm initiated Take people's faith and I dissipated with false promises Hollow oratory, don't need a gun It's daylight robbery, dear Mr. Devil I thought you would like it, I use the faith in God to keep them blinded On a nice voice, read them a book And they believe that I'm not a crook Tell them, God will repay them in the neck They give me their life savings so I can buy jets All the reports about child sex None of us have ever gone jail yet A system of stealing, so appealing Convinces the victims that life has meaning Monarchs boast about conquest But needed my blessings to get it done and all of the dictators use my books therefore they are just my son the devil was sure this was the winner and was just about to put an end to the dinner but then the man from the banking cartel stepped up and said i think i'm the biggest sinner all of those three depend on me all they ever do is defending me because i paid for all of the things they have of course and the life that they need paid for the guns bombs and the tanks that's why you see there is always more i turn science basic appliance into a client of weapon of war paid for monarchies armories i make monopolies out of property never shot a gun nor kill anyone Myself, but billions die because of me. Who needs a threat? I make a debt out of thin air, just sit back and collect every single day. Whatever they say, the people need me just to connect. Yet none of them knows what I look like. Yet all of them spend my money to look nice. They want more, no one's pure. I hold the keys to every single door, sell sex and drugs, profit and lies. Earth and skies are even so life, I even sell freedom for the right price. They're not smart enough to ask me nice. So, Mr. Devil, give me the medal, don't be biased. If you don't give it to me, I'll just buy it.
soaring. 